Hey Discipleship Class, hey welcome to another video. We today are going to discuss session, num or session number five, which is the temptation of Jesus Christ. The temptation in the wilderness. So we have a lot of things to discuss here and this is a big broad lesson mm -hmm. and it's going to take two sessions to yep. do it and there's good reasoning. There is great theological questions for everyone to think about it made us think about it and we were yes. discussing it these are pretty deep mm -hmm. so we thank you for showing up and watching our video for us uh tim what do you got anything to say before we get started i'm just uh it seems like the lord has blessed me with a good mood today today has been a good day i hope today has been a good day for you and uh i just pray that this uh a deeper study on jesus and his temptations can help uh brighten your spirit help uh, put that passion back in you. And that's, uh, that's what I'm praying for. Great, Tim. All right, before we get started, and before we talk about these great theological, deep theological things, let's start with a word of prayer. Uh, dear Lord, thank you for this time that we can talk about you and your word and just read how what Jesus went through in the desert and what he had to suffer through as far as not just physical, but also spiritual and emotional. Lord, be with us as we teach this lesson. Let everybody that hears it be blessed. And in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Again, we're thankful that you are here with us as we dive deeper into our discipleship study. So if you have your student books, please turn to session five as we look at the life of Jesus. And when we look at session five, we're going to be talking about the temptation of Jesus now, you may be thinking, I know some things about temptation. We know the things that tempt us and come against us, but we're going to be looking at temptation uh, through uh, Christ and look at that story there. But we want to begin with this question here, and this is a deep question. If Jesus is God, which he is, was it really possible for him to be tempted to sin? Hmm. Now, I think a lot of Christians have probably asked that question either to themselves or to other people. Wow. And I think it's a deep question. That is a very deep question. So when we look at this, we know that Jesus, as God, could never sin. The Bible tells us that he was without sin, he is without blemish. But somehow when Jesus left heaven and came to earth, he restricted his divine attributes. Now what that means is though he is fully God, he is also fully man. But he chose to set aside so what we call his majesty. Though he still had abilities that God had, he decided to put those aside as he wanted to endure uh, things that our flesh would endure, as he wanted to go through the similar things that we would go through on a daily basis. So this means that Jesus had all the limitations that every one of us face, apart from a sinful nature. So that's what uh, separates him from us. It also means that Jesus had to make some types of decisions that Adam and Eve had to make, and each of us have to make daily. So he had to struggle with the same tensions that every man has to face physically, emotionally, and spiritually. So that tells us that Jesus being in the flesh, did he get upset from time to time? We can almost say yes. Was he hungry from time to time? We would say yes to that. Almost definitely. Did he cry? Did he weep? Did he feel sorrow? For those around him, Scripture tells us. In fact, John eleven thirty five, the shortest verse in the Bible, says he wept. So we know he felt these emotional things. He felt the physical parts of what it means to be human. But let's look real quick in the Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 through 15. It reads, So then, since we have a great high priest, being Jesus, who has entered heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold him firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings that we do, yet he did not sin. So this is a very important verse. It tells us that he has been through the same things that we have been through. 
Sometimes we may sit at home, we're probably sitting on our couch or our desk, wherever we may be, and we sometimes think, you don't understand what I've been through. Now, some of us probably haven't been through the same things you've been through, but we see here that Jesus has, and that's why we, have, that's why we love him so much. So Aaron's going to continue as we look at the next question. So here's another kind of a deep question, and you know, I haven't even really heard this in this way. Did not Jesus have an unfair advantage dealing with temptation due to the fact that he didn't even have a sinful nature? Mm. That's a tough question. Yeah. <laughs> Think about it that way. Did it was it unfair that he wasn't born of this sinful nature? Um, this has actually made the type of the temptations that Jesus faced that much more intense. Mm. So think of it this way. The majority of the times we are tempted, they're focused on our sin nature. Mm -hmm. That's what our temptations are focused on, right? Whatever, and we'll discuss some of these. Yes. Due to our sin nature, we're inclined to do wrong. And we're already inclined to be self-serving. Mm. Just automatically. It's, 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 it's hard, and that's why we have the Holy Spirit in us. Yes. To help us, guide us, to try so we're not responding to our sinful nature. Now, I like to, I'm going to say some words that, it, what's another word for sinful nature, Tim? Uh, wickedness or flesh? Flesh. You might hear me say of the flesh. You might have heard some other people in our church say, you know, our flesh nature, our flesh, our, nature. Our flesh that we deal with. It's the sin nature that we're talking about. So if you ever get confused over if it's like sin nature or flesh, if they're two different things, they're actually the same, the same. thing. So the temptations that Jesus faced, turning the stones into bread, jumping off the temple, and having angels catch him, right, were not inherently wrong in and of themselves. You know, why would that be a sin, you know, no. if that was, you know, to happen. But on the surface, you know, on the surface they didn't seem wrong. They promised a greater good for others. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Jesus was tempted according to his perfect nature. And this made the temptation much more appealing and strong. Yet Jesus resisted. So we're going to discuss more on this. So the, the Bible describes three types of temptations we all face. And they're in 1 John. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. So, we're going to talk about the first verse, 16. 1 John, uh, well that's not the first verse. We're going to talk about 1 John 2, 16. How about we just discuss that? <laughs> Obviously I'm not having, I'm having an issue reading. For the word offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but of the world. Of the world. So, describe these three temptations in your own words, and we're going to go through them. Tim? So I guess the first one we look at Based on what John tells us there in 1 John chapter 2, we see that there is a physical craving. So we want to just kind of throw these out there. What, what is a physical craving that you have? Aaron and I are going to discuss a few, but you can also uh, define these as your, uh, yourself. That we know for some, alcohol could be a physical craving. Right. Drugs. Drugs. Yep. Could be uh, food. I think I have a little bit of a problem there. <laughs> well, lust. How about that? That word lust. Lust. And that covers a broad spectrum. Yes. What now, now I know, I'm sorry, no, no, just no. lust is a bad thing. Now, some of us may say, well, what if I have a sexual desire for my wife? What? But if we're doing it the way that God called us to do it in marriage only, there's nothing wrong with that. Now, we can abuse that as well, but lust is a physical craving that we have. And so, we're going to talk about the next one, because 
These are thinkers. I want you guys to think about all of these. The second one is cravings of the eyes. Well, we were just talking about lust. Mm -hmm. How about lust of cravings of the eyes? You know, looking, having your wandering eye or... Pornography. Yep, looking at things you shouldn't be looking at, <laughs> right? I mean, it's a serious thing, especially in our culture. In it the is. United States, it's it a is. serious thing that we're dealing with today. And, and I know I've done a study and the numbers are almost identical when it comes to believers and non-believers when it comes to viewing pornography on the, on the internet. Oh, well, that's just sad. <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. That's yeah. just sad. Um, but another one we talk about, envy. Envy. What, what would you think envy would work with? Well, I mean, we, we know envy sometimes could be maybe a position at a workplace, maybe of uh, material goods, maybe you're envious of a co-worker or a family member's new uh, vehicle. Maybe they uh, someone bought a new purse and you really wanted that purse. Yeah. But it, it can stretch uh, very far and wide. Right. And it cannot just be just uh, material items, right? It yeah. can be of people. Of people. I'm envious of, you know, this person or that for for whatever reason. Yeah. You know, it's you know, I wish that per I wish I had blonde hair. You know, I mean, I'm that's, that's right. That's true. People envy over this stuff. That's true. And it's just not women. Guys do it too. Don't be sitting there, guys, and be like, <laughs> "Oh, I don't do any of that stuff." Right. Just for gray male, just for men. Oh, yeah. Hey, I wish I had long, flowing blonde hair. I don't know what it looked like with my my physique, but. <laughs> so the third one, Tim. What is it? So we we threw another one out there, and it's greed. Now. Would you say you have fallen for greed before? Because I know sometimes uh, money can be there. It doesn't always have to be monetarily. Uh, greed does come in many different forms. Uh, uh, I've lost for words. Uh, from different angles. Yeah. Greed can seep in all from different places. But uh, some of us say, well, the love of money is a root of evil. Well, if you read it really close, the love of money is a root of uh, of all evil. Yeah. That's yeah. an important distinction. Yeah. Not not money is the root of all evil, but the love of money is, is the root of all evil. So you have to read that scripture very close. So the third one we want to... Did you have anything to add there? No, I'm good. So the third one we want to look at in the story today is pride. Now, some of us may say, well, I don't struggle with pride. <laughs> but I think that, that statement itself could be struggling with pride. I don't... I don't. <laughs> I'm not prideful. No, <laughs> absolutely not. I don't know what you're talking about. But what what are, what are some of the things that fall under pride? I don't know. Selfishness. Selfishness. How about this? I'm a legend in my own mind. Mm. Have you, you ever felt that way? <laughs> have you? I, I know I have. <laughs> <laughs> some of those guys are thinking they're going. Oh, no, I'm not mm -hmm. like that at all. No, absolutely not. I think another one that can fall under pride is jealousy. Oh, yeah. Jealousy can also go along with greed and, and, and envy. But it slides right there with them. That we can be jealous. We find ourselves being jealous of other people's situations. And I know as someone who grew up very poverty, I remember sitting there and saying, well, if I only had what they had. And you see how that jealousy can creep in. What about, you know, what would you say that you want to be noticed more? Yes. Right? That pride of you want people just showering affection on me saying, yes, yes, I like it. You yeah. know, it's yeah. like, so you do things to get their attention. So I'm going to throw something out. It's going to be a little, maybe a little bit controversial. Uh, people do some good work saying they're doing it for God. Mm. Maybe they're doing it for themselves and they're looking for that reward. Remember, Jesus said things to people like that. You'll get your reward, yeah. but it won't be the reward that you're looking for in heaven. You're getting that reward actually here on the earth. You, yes. get, that, you get that applause. Yeah. You get that applause. So you have to be your motives, right? Yeah. Your motives matter when you're working for God, yeah. when you're doing things for Him, when you're doing that out of love yeah. and reverence and worship, not for, hey, look at me. I just did this for the church and yeah. you know, fill in that blank. You've already received your reward at that point. Yeah, exactly. So, we have a verse. Actually, verse fits. We have a 
a lot of verses. And we're going to look Luke 4, 1 through 13. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually bring this full screen, and I'll just you know read out the verse or the verses to you, and then we'll come back here and when we're done with that. Luke 4, 1 through 13. Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Jesus ate nothing all that time and became very hungry. Verse 3, Then the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, change this bread into a loaf of bread. But Jesus told him, No, the scriptures say, People do not live by bread alone. Verse 5, then the devil took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them, the devil said, because they are mine to give to anyone I please. I will give it to all to you if you will worship me. Jesus replied, the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Verse 9, Then the devil took him to Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, If you are the Son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say, He will order his angels to protect and guard you, and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. When the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. So Tim, how do these temptations actually correspond to the ones listed by John? So looking back into the passage that we read, of Jesus' temptation found in the Gospel of Luke. We do look at these three things the way Satan tempted Christ, but we want to break these things down here. So we know the first one, uh, Satan tempts Christ and asks him to turn these stones to bread. Now what craving would that correspond to? Well, if we look at the temptation here, we see that turning stones to bread would fall under physical cravings. As we know that the story tells us, Jesus was fasting. He was in the wilderness fasting. But now the adversary approaches him, knowing that this man is in the flesh. He's starving at this point. And he's trying to tempt him to turn his stone to bread to see if he can trip him up to break his fast. So the next one. Authority over all the kingdoms. So it'd be cravings of the eyes, right? So what did what did uh, Satan do? He showed him, showed Jesus all of the kingdoms of the world, right? He says, if you just worship me, everything you have is yours. Power, authority. Yeah. Man, that sounds very tempting, even just for, you know, us, you know, people here on earth that sounds great you know hey all you have to do is do this one thing and people have you know the idea of selling your soul yeah it's happened it I is mean, happening it's happened yep you know just to get power fame and stuff like that yep. that's what that's what this Satan was just offering to jesus yeah so you know cravings of the eyes it looks tempting you can get all of this and you're you know it's a thing yeah and just from what he was saying, that goes back to what we read earlier, 1 John chapter 2, that these things are of the world, not of God. This is what the world wants to offer you. They offer you these uh, temporal uh, pleasures, only to have you trip up and, and eventually um, not find your way to Jesus. But Jesus offers us something that's much deeper than what just brings us quick pleasure and quick joy. But when we look at the third portion here, Satan asked Jesus to jump off the temple. So when we look at that, this falls under pride. Now some of you might say, well, how does, how does that correspond? 
Well, we, we can see that Satan himself, as he's talking to Jesus, he's saying, because you are, if you're the son of God, if you're this person who is in that high position, if you're so high and mighty, jump off, because I guarantee you, you won't even be able to hit the ground before the angels come down and protect you. Right. So the angels would have swooped down and caught him from, uh, I guess, ultimately committing suicide. Yep. Uh, so he even says that your foot wouldn't even hit the edge of a stone. So not anything would be uh, hurt on, on his body. So he's trying to show that pride, saying, I'm in such a high position, I can do whatever I want, I have people to fall back on, they're always going to catch me. So we see how that pride can sleep, uh, sleep in, sneak in. Sorry, it's not sleep in. <laughs> I would like to sleep in tomorrow morning, but... <laughs> we get to. We do. It's Memorial Day. Memorial Day tomorrow. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. So, let's talk about what Tim just said and, and the other temptations. You know, Satan is very good at using Scripture. Yes. In fact, he knows more Scripture than most Christians. Do. Yes. And that, that really shouldn't be. We should read more daily when, you know, when Satan does speak to us through Scripture, we can do like Jesus did and speak Scripture back. back. So the next question down here, what was Jesus' secret to consistently resisting a temptation throughout his entire life? Now, we have to, it's a good question. You've got to think about it, right? So we're just talking about, hey, the temptation of Jesus in the desert when he's 40 days in. He yeah. was tempted. All through his ministry. All through his ministry. And his life. Yep, exactly. And, you know, we have to think about it. You know, the Pharisees tempted tempted him, trying to trip him up. And every, every time. So we have to remember that, you know, he had to resist his temptation. Yes. So we're going to now look. At every temptation, specifically more in depth, so you can see why this is going to take two videos. Mm -hmm. We, you know, we've been just discussing yep. the introduction. The introduction. So now, Tim is going to talk about the start of the first one. So as we dig a little bit deeper, we're going to look at temptation one. So in Luke chapter four, verse three, reads: Then the devil said to him, If you are the son of God, change this stone into a loaf of bread. Now, some of you may think, well, man, I'd really love to be able to do that. That would be cool to see that. But we have to understand the reason why Satan was trying to get Jesus to trip up that way. So, as I have on the screen here, we have to explain the nature of this temptation and why it would have been wrong for Jesus to give in. So, when we look at this, little, uh, this first temptation, we know that as Jesus was uh, fasting... Jesus was on the verge of physical starvation. Now, some of you out there, you may have uh, tested yourself in fasting. In fact, it should be a, a regular practice for Christians because we know that Jesus says this type of faith only comes through both prayer and fasting. So that is part of our, our, what we're doing at obedience to Christ. But how many of you have ever made it past maybe four or five days? I know personally I've made it to seven days. And I know that was probably one of the hardest things I've ever done. Because when you're so dependent on food and drink, you don't realize what you're depriving your, your, your flesh. Your flesh needs those calories to burn. But here Jesus is at 40 days of fasting in the wilderness. So you know his flesh was definitely desiring that food to the point of starvation. So at this, point, at this point, his body starts to deprive lesser parts of the body of what they need so that the brain can get all its uh, need for the fight for survival. Every fiber of Jesus' being would have desperately craved the food and possibly the water for survival. But Satan is merely encouraging Jesus to do what he naturally longed to do. Jesus was starving. He was trying to say, all you have to do is tell that rock to turn to bread, and all of this can go away. So the next question, and this is a pretty powerful question. Mm -hmm. Would it have been sinful for Jesus to turn a stone into a loaf of bread to avoid, to avoid starvation? Well, we have to 
thing about Jesus performed miracles just like that. Just like that. So he turned water into wine, multiplied loaves and fish. Yep. Out of, out of like, to feed 5,000, well, actually more than that, right? Yeah, more than that. That was, oh, just, that was just the men. Right? Over five, you know, five loaves and two fishes. Really? I mean, <laughs> so, and, and then he cursed a fig tree that bore no fruit. Got tax money from a fish's mouth. You remember that story? Remember that story? I remember that. That one is pretty cool. There was nothing intrinsically sinful about turning a stone into bread. Mm-hmm. Let's think here. I want, That's you think. Guys, I want you guys to think about yeah, it. Yeah, have you ever thought of that question? Maybe yeah. you have, and I hope this helps you to understand that. So the next question is, why was Jesus in the wilderness the first place? Hmm. So he just got finished being baptized by John the Baptist. John the Baptist. And he was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness too fast to actually go through this. Yeah. God's plan was to have him experience the same challenges faced by the Israelites when they traveled through the wilderness for 40 years. That's an interesting thought. That is an interesting thought. Okay. Jesus' 40 days is symbolic of the years Israel spent in the wilderness. You ever thought about it that way? Mm. The Israelites failed when they were tested as to their faithfulness. Jesus now needs to prove his righteousness when the rest of mankind failed. Wow. Deep? That is deep. So the fast was God's agenda, God's time, and God's purpose. Mm-hmm. And the fast was not yet declared over by God. When we were talking about this bread, turning the you know, stone into bread, the fast was not over yet. Yeah. So if Jesus gave in Satan's encouragement to eat, he would have broken God's ordained fast. Yes. Before God's intended time. It meant that Jesus would have allowed his physical needs to direct his life as opposed to the will of the Father. That, that is good. If Jesus couldn't survive this physical suffering, there was no way he would make it to the cross. That's when it gets deep. Yeah. So, that's pretty powerful. I'd say this lesson right here and one after it is pretty deep and pretty thoughtful. Mm-hmm. Um, so, man. Wow. Tim, you have that. So, when we look at Jesus' response to Satan, we ask this question here. Why did Jesus respond with the words, It is written, man does not live on bread alone. So, some of us can come up with different ideas, but what's really good about Jesus, what he did better, I think, than anyone, was to quote Old Testament scripture. Like Aaron said earlier, Satan knows scripture, but Jesus combated that with scripture himself. So we're going to zoom in real quick on Deuteronomy, uh, going back to the Old Testament, chapter 8, verses 2 through 3. So please follow along as we read this, and then we're going to dig a little bit into why this is important, coming from the Old Testament. Deuteronomy, chapter 8, verses 2 through 3. Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would really obey his commands. Yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people need more than bread for their life. Real life comes by feeding on every word of the Lord. So why did God Aaron, why did God allow the Israelites to go hungry at various points in time? Well, a good question let's talk about it he did this to test their faithfulness not that he needed to know where they stood but he wanted them to see how much they really trusted him Mm. by letting them go hungry it revealed their heart relationship to god as in how they felt how their relationship was to them in their heart right Mm. it exposed that they would follow God to the extent that he served 
them the way they want it. Mm. Do you expect God to do things the way you want? <laughs> That's a hard question. It's a very hard question. It's a very hard question. The temptation was to set their cravings above obedience and faithfulness to God. Mm. In other words, they made their stomach their God, and God was merely a means to serve the demands of the stomach. <laughs> wow. That is pretty rough. That's, yeah. So, <laughs> how often are we tempted in a similar way? It's a, that's a question. It's a good question, and, you know, it's, I'll let you all just think of the answer. It's a, it can be pretty big. So I'm just going to go to the next one. Can you share a time when you were mad at God because he didn't meet your expectations? Did God question, did you question God's love for you during this time? So does, so I can honestly say that, you know, there were times when I could have answered both of these questions. Yes. And I think most people would have that at least yeah. some point in their life. Why, God, did you allow this to happen? Oh, yeah. You know, you know why you don't love me? You know, why? Did, why? You, you know you've had that, you know, if you're honest, you've had that question yeah. done in your life. And so I want you to just think about it. If you're sitting with a loved one at your home, maybe ask them that question. Mm. You may not have an answer right away because you have to really think about it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So when we look at the next question here, I know that a lot of us can relate to this question. Have you ever tried to take control of a situation yourself because God didn't seem to care? And I, I can't even tell you the numerous times I felt that exact same way. That, like Aaron was saying, of the flesh. We, and I don't want to just say just as men, because men do it and women do it. When we see a problem, it's inclined that we should fix it. At least we try to. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those times, if we really sit back and look at those situations, most of the time, those things are out of our control anyway. That's true. But it still drives us to take action. And sometimes the action is not what God wants us to do. So when we look at that, have you ever tried to take control of a situation yourself because God didn't care? Now, we're here to both to tell you, God does care. Yes. God cares for every small detail in life. There's a reason he created it that way. Now, sometimes it doesn't seem like it, it, things fall in our favor, but that's because we're thinking through the flesh. So it's funny, we, we talk about this. Aaron and I earlier were talking about prayer and how God responds to prayer. He does. He either says yes or no, and sometimes he tells us not yet. So in the flesh, we want, we always, when we ask God, we want things to be yes. But when God doesn't give us that yes, that should tell us, that ultimately he has a better answer for us. So just know that God does care. So going to the next question, have you ever tried to shortcut God's purpose for your life simply because it wasn't comfortable? Mm. Mm. <laughs> you, you think about that. Again, going back to the flesh, we want to be comfortable. We, we love the circle that we're in. We, we create a comfort zone. But we know following Jesus, he calls us to step out of the comfort zone. He calls us to do something that goes against our sin nature. We are to walk in the Spirit. Yeah. Jesus gave us, gives us the great commission that we are to bring His good news, which is the gospel of what He's done for us on the cross, that He rose on the third day, and because of that, we have new life. We are, have now been reconciled back to God. So when we look at that, have you ever tried a shortcut we know when God has a plan for us, we may say, well, Lord, if you're telling me that's the years down the road, i got to get this taken care of now. And then we do, we act upon our nature. Mm -hmm. And we know sometimes those things never work out. Did you have anything to add to that? No, no that's, that's very, well, very well spoken. So just know if, you're, if you call yourself a true Christian, a true follower of Jesus, just know that your walk is never going to be completely comfortable. You're going to be asked to do things that Jesus asked you to do. And it's always going to be in his name. Right. And to know, again, at the Great Commission, he tells us at the very end, 
of Matthew 28, verse 20, that he's with us to the end of the age. So we have that hope that when we do these things, he's with us. So let's not shortcut things when it comes to God's purpose for our life. Because he has, he sees the whole picture. Mm-hmm. We only see it as the, the minutes and the hours come. Right. And it's just, you know, it, it, we, I saw it today on, you know, how things that are happening, like, you know, our pastor Keith, our pastor, prepares messages. Yes. Months in advance. And how today's message, through certain events, in our lives, or in my life, mm. it's just hitting the nail right on the head. I, it, it is uncanny. It's like you. Yes. It's like he wrote it last night. <laughs> I'm serious. Mm-hmm. And uh, knowing that he is so far in advance, and how God makes that plan, yes. it's just one little tidbit of you know how we don't see it right away, but then when we when God reveals it, it's like that aha moment. Uh, I see what you were yeah. doing. Yeah. And one, one more thing to add. So uh, some of us have heard this before. If you really want to make God laugh, make plans. <laughs> yes. That's funny. Yeah, that's, that's true. Yes, I would have to say that's true. So let's look at the last couple of questions we're going to talk about here. What was Jesus' key to resisting this temptation? What statement did he make to Satan? So we're going to look at the four declarations, I believe, right? Yeah, this is the overview of what we're looking at in Temptation 1. Yeah. So, Jesus declared that he would not make the same decision that the Israelites made. Mm. They chose their stomachs over God. Wow. And he understood true life comes from obedience to God more than from food. Wow. Wow. So, next bullet point. Cravings, feelings, would not determine what he did with his life, but rather the will of God, the will of his Father. Mm. And the last uh, point we're going to talk about is that he would not cut short, shortcut, cut short, God's purpose for his life simply because it was uncomfortable. And after 40 days of not eating, yeah. It's uncomfortable. We know it's uncomfortable. So as we look at that first temptation, some of these things might have rung close to home for us. We know that we suffer from physical cravings. It's Our flesh does desire some of these things. We also have the desires of the eyes, the things that we look upon. And we also, some of us, have fallen to pride. And we can find these three elements all throughout the Bible, as, especially with pride. Uh, we find that a lot in Proverbs. Yeah. That God, uh, he humbles, or he loves the humble, but he despises the prideful. Yeah. So we know that's that's what, that's what God looks at. So we have to humble ourselves. But as we look at this temptation again, where, where are you right now in, in your faith with Christ? Where are you at in your walk? Are you struggling with some of these temptations? Just know if you're out there and you have one of these uh, things that you're struggling with, just know you're not alone. Number one, you have God, and you can reach Him through prayer. Number two, you have the church here at First Christian Church. You have many uh, family here that's willing to help you through those things. So just know you're not battling these things alone, as many of us have been through very similar situations. So please, just reach out to us, and we'd love to help you and comfort you in any way that we can. And, and just lastly, just keep following Jesus. As we look at this uh, first part of the temptation, uh, we see that as Jesus fasted, he was ultimately relying, learning how to rely on God and not himself. As we are in the flesh, can we do that? Can we rely more on God and not on ourselves? And it really is easier than said than done. And we know that because we're on this side. We, we've been through that. Anything you want to add, sir? No, it's, you know, very, very well said, very well spoken. You're invited. Our church is open. Open. You're invited to come. It's uh, First Christian Church in Cape Coral off the of Country Club. You're invited to come. It's very, very, you'll like it. Very family oriented. So please come and join us. Have fun with us. We want to challenge you to take that next step of obedience in your faith and your walk with Christ as we do the same. 
And we have faith that God's going to work miracles through you if you're willing to be obedient to his calling. Again, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time. God bless. Awesome. My foot's already going numb. <laughs>